Good evening, I'm John Carter. Welcome to Poland Daily. The European Parliament elections are only a month away and the political battle in Poland is nearing its peak. The major parties held their conventions during the last week, with the currently ruling Law and Justice Party firmly opposing both the proposal of a two-speed Europe and the European coalition scare tactics, in which they accused Law and Justice of steering the country towards a poll exit. The past weekend was filled with political parties' conventions as the pre-election campaign speed up before the May elections for the European Parliament. We see members of the nationalist movement with torches being sworn in at Jasna Gura. We see the government allowing the brown processions. We see that just before the elections they once again say they love Europe, but they show the exact opposite. Our main goal is equal development. We want this development not because we are representatives of some kind of ideology. We want it as Poles, because the Polish nation has to be a community, but the community must be something real. Today we are facing a very important step in our fight, on our road, the European Parliament elections. The elections for the European Parliament, which we will approach with the slogan Poland in Europe, Europe for Poland. The Spring Party's conference also took place on Saturday in Wrocław. Robert Biedroń once again proposed a meeting between the leaders of the three main parties. Duels on conventions are interesting, but duels on programs are more important. I'm waiting for Schetyna and Kaczynski on May 3rd. It's time to talk about the future of Poland in Europe. According to the expert on public image, Andrzej Pomarański, the European Parliament pre-election campaign in Poland has two very different views. On one side we have the approach of the European coalition, which focuses on negative emotions all the time, throwing around general truths and accusations which may be well phrased, but are lacking concrete ideas and propositions for the potential voters on how they see the future of Poland in the EU. On the other side we have the campaign of the Law and Justice Party, which apart from presenting their stance on the future of the European Union, also presents factual solutions for Poles in matters which will affect them directly, an example to make the quality of everyday products the same as Western European countries. This reaches the voters as it will matter in their everyday lives. The European Parliament elections will take place on May 26. Poles will be choosing 52 MEPs in 13 constituencies. Two days from now, on May the 1st, Poland will be celebrating the 15th anniversary of European Union membership. Many festivities will be held all across the country. The Minister of Investment and Development, Jerzy Kwiatkowski, summed up the benefits of the cohesion policy of the European Union. Thanks to Poland's presence in the European Union and the support Poland is receiving on the basis of the EU cohesion policy, we were able to realize over 200,000 investments in our country. We were given 675 billion zlotys, most of which has already been spent to aid investments. We can say that thanks to the European funds and our presence in the EU, Poland is a completely different country when compared compared to the state we were in back in 2004. At that point we said we could do this, but in reality, thanks to us being a part of the European Union and making use of the cohesion policy, we were able to accomplish certain goals. The new Spanish nationalist Vox party was the big winner in an otherwise inconclusive Spanish election. Vox, which won only 0.2% of the vote in 2016, received 10.3%. The Spanish Socialist Party became the biggest party with 28.7%, but will not be able to form a majority coalition government without the support of separatist parties. The result means that snap elections could take place later this year. Spain's far-right party leader Santiago Abascal said his party achieved a great feat in the national vote and it was just getting started. Abascal's Vox party clinched 24 seats in the national parliament following the vote on Sunday, a first for the far-right in four decades. 
I was convinced that someday we were going to get representation. On October 6, before the Vistalegre rally, the debate was if Vox would enter parliament with one lawmaker or two, or whether we would remain out of parliament. We are not talking about six years ago, but just six months ago. Six months ago, the debate was whether Vox would enter parliament or not. And today, Vox has 24 MPs. And that is why I say it is a great feat. Vox has laid out its position as an anti-immigrant and anti-abortion party that opposes gender equality laws it says discriminate against men, and with an unwavering opposition to Catalonia's drive for independence. We keep saying that whoever enters Spain illegally needs to be deported. We don't know if we are going to gain more votes with this position, but we are not saying it to win votes. We believe it is a common sense issue and we have to defend it. We don't think this is a far right, right or left issue. I am sure that there are a lot of people watching in their homes who are left-wing supporters and they are worried about illegal immigration, mass migration or that borders are not being respected. The inconclusive result of the election is likely to result in snap elections later this year. The leaders of far-right populist Dutch and French parties gathered in Prague as their Czech allies, the SPD, launched the party's campaign for next month's European elections. The ENF party group, fronted by Italian Minister of Interior Matteo Salvini, is expected to become the big winner of the European elections. The party leader of SDP, Tomio Okamura, is Japanese-Czech businessman and head of the largest far-right populist party in the Czech Republic. He argues that the European right-wing parties must unite against mass immigration and EU federalism. The common position in our political group is that we want to return freedom and sovereignty to the European states. We want to finish with the directives of Brussels and return authority to individual countries. The leader of the French national rally, Marine Le Pen, concurred and added that the fight against Islamist radicalism must be an absolute priority. Immigration should be stopped and Islamic ideology should be eradicated. Globalization should be regulated and economy and oligarchies returned to their proper place. Gerd Wilders of the Dutch Party for Freedom was frank about wanting the Netherlands to leave the EU but acknowledged that it's currently not an option. I would rather uh, that the Netherlands um, and this is uh, a national decision, would leave the European Union. But an exit, as we call it. But to be honest, um, there is, after the Brexit, unfortunately not a majority in, under the Dutch public, the Dutch electorate, um, let alone in the Dutch uh, parliament, uh, to support such a decision. Thanks to the decisions of the Danish People's Party and the Party of the True Finns to join the ENF party group, as well as the record high level of support for the Italian Lega party, the ENF is likely to increase its share of mandates the most of all party groups in next month's European election. Thank you very much for joining us here this evening at Poland Daily. I'm John Carter. Stay tuned after the break for Poland Daily Weather. It's followed by the business, the culture, history and finally the travel. I'm Alexandra Zarzycka and welcome to Poland Daily Weather. Let's take a look at the forecast for tonight. Temperatures will grow up a little to 17 degrees in Białystok. In central Poland, temperature will range from 10 to 11 degrees. The wind will be the strongest on the north and in central. Rainfall is expected almost in every region except Szczecin and Gdańsk. Let's see the forecast for tomorrow. Maximum temperatures will be 18 degrees in Bydgoszcz. The minimum will be 13 in Katowice and Lubin. On the south, rainfall will appear. More sunlight is expected in central and on the north. Let's check the weather for the next days. On Wednesday, temperature range from 15 to 17 degrees. A lot of sun will appear on the whole country. On Thursday, little rain will appear on the northwest and on the southeast. Friday will bring us more rainfall. Thank you for watching and goodbye. You are watching Poland Daily Business Edition and we will talk to Adrian Kubicki of uh, Lot Polish Airlines about the visa pro waiver program to United States, sir. Welcome to the show. Hello. 
We spoke a couple of months ago regarding the action that uh, has been undertaken by the lot Polish airlines. Uh, your uh, comp organization was inviting Poles to apply for United States as a visa in order to get uh, to fulfill the requirements for the visa waiver program. Right now, uh, this uh, program is is going to continue. And what are the results and what we are expecting this year? Uh, first of all, what has changed um, um, within these few months um, is very p positive result, which we already know uh, for previous year. Um, we went down from almost 6% of the refusal rate uh, to uh, less than 4%. So for the first time uh, in the history of Poland, uh, we were able to reach out to the point where we are very close, only one. Um, a percent um, away from from the goal that we have and the, this goal is to at the end of this fiscal year uh, so by the end of uh, of uh, September we would like to be at the at the level of below three percent even 2.99 is enough to be uh, included to the visa waiver program um, without any additional um, uh, action needed to be taken on, on the political level or, or any other level. Um, uh, we are very glad another very important factor and, and success of our, com our campaign is that we have a great partner. Um, U.S. Embassy in Warsaw um, is right now also aiming and fighting to, 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 to for this uh, for this result to be improved and completed by the end of the fiscal year. They started their own campaign, which is called uh, Visa Waiver for Poland. Uh, and together we have the same goal, so we, we have the same messages. We would like to have as many good applicants as possible to, to lower down the, the number by the end of the year. And at the same time, we advise people how to uh, apply for visa um, uh, to make it in a way that, which will enable people to, to get this visa, so, so just to do it right. Well, the, the problem is that, first of all, this is a decades-old uh, issue. I, don't I can't recall any Polish politician on the level of prime minister or president who didn't promise that he will deliver the visa free travel to the United States. So far, didn't happen. But uh, on the other hand, Poland is the only one country of the European Union that is not allowed to this visa waiver program. And um, the Polish destinations changed. The, the, the visa waiver program and this, uh, um, was not designed for guys who were seeking for illegal work in the United States, and unfortunately, lots of Poles did that. That was the past. Today, it's just uh, people go for vacation or for shopping. Well, last few years showed that Poland is rising star, rising star among other countries in Europe. And, and in fact, if we look at the uh, so-called overstate rate, so another factor that is uh, also pretty closely watched by, by American uh, customs and border control, uh, we have better results than Germany, than other Western countries. Uh, overstate mean that people who s uh, stay longer than, than the period of time which is indicated uh, um, on, on their visas. Um, so, so you're absolutely right. I don't expect that any uh, mass of people will, will use this opportunity to, to pack their bags and, and leave their country uh, flying away from home. Uh, we live in the European Union in a Schengen zone, zone which gives Polish citizens certain opportunities to, to seek for jobs or another, another living opportunities uh, within Europe. And we know that even that is not very attractive because Poland is j j simply a very good place to live in. Uh, to earn money to 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 build up career uh, however we also since we are growing uh, our economy and people are growing their businesses they just want to travel uh, to many places across the world also seeking business opportunities partnerships etc this opportunity is uh, opportunity is very limited due to to the fact that that polish people needs to have visa you have to plan your trip in that very well in advance and, and it doesn't really match to, to some of the occasions that they might have, they might have um, uh, doing their business. Uh, being in the visa waiver pro program gives these people 
uh, plenty of opportunities to do their business uh, with their partners uh, in the United States of America. On the other hand, you mentioned that uh, people want wants to explore world and uh, and uh, tourist attractions, and United States of America is a country which is very uh, diverse, I would say. Uh, different type of types of climates, different architecture, uh, different nature on each of the corner of this very big white country. Uh, so I think that yes, this is also a great destination, uh, destination for many Poles who will just go there, come back to Poland, they will visit their friends and relatives, not necessarily uh, willing to stay there for illegal work or for any other purposes. Okay, let us focus on another issue of this kaleidoscope, namely the interest of the company you represent. The Lot Polish Airlines is developing, is growing, and uh, this visa waiver program, do you expect that this will give a hike in your uh, reservations in the uh, uh, in Atlantic routes? We see that in the short-term perspective, but also in the long-term perspective. So starting from the short-term perspective, uh, for us, obviously, um, uh, flights to United States um, is the key of, of, of our operations. We've been to this market for 50 years, nearly 50 years. Uh, we are very well perceived. We have uh, awareness, proper awareness, meaning that uh, we will be growing our business there and uh, waiving visa will actually boost demand on, on travels. Uh, will enable us to open up uh, connections to secondary places uh, which are not open yet and cannot be open with, with the visa requirements. On the other hand, uh, being in the um, visa waiver family will give us opportunity to build a proper hub, central uh, transportation hub, which perhaps also be place of pre-clearance, uh, which will enable passengers from all over the world to cross US border in the airport uh, in Warsaw, uh, which will obviously be great for will be great for lot, but also for Polish economy as, as the as the entire economy. Or in the future airport, uh, in the Baranov or this famous yes. Solidarity airport. A new facility which will be greatly uh, built, designed and and built to to meet the requirements and. Uh, really, with with the visa waiver program uh, uh, inc included, uh, which will include Poland, uh, we can have this preclearance in, in Poland and Warsaw, and be major gateway for many people from Western and uh, Eastern and Central Europe uh, to commute to to travel to the United States. Thank you very much, and hopefully this will work this time, and uh, the building blocks of your strategy will also work, uh, Adrian. Kubicki, a spokesman of Lot Polish Airlines, was our guest, and you've been watching Poland Daily Business. Welcome back to Poland Daily Weather. Let's take a look at the forecast for tomorrow. Maximum temperatures will be 18 degrees in Bydgoszcz. The minimum will be 13 in Katowice and Lublin. On the south, rainfall will appear. More sunlight is expected in central Poland and on the north. Let's check the weather for Europe. In Balkans, temperature range from 20 in Sofia to 24 in Athens. Still warm on the Iberian Peninsula. Temperatures range between 24 and 27 degrees in Madrid. In Central Europe, more rain is expected. Thank you for watching and see you soon. Łukasz Napora was a co-creator of one of Poland's biggest music festivals, Audio River. He was there from the inception until 2017 and was responsible for marketing, public relations and partly for the programme. Every year was a sellout from 2013 onwards and the event now gathers 30,000 people over three days. Wukash is currently working as a freelance consultant and helps all kinds of music and brands with getting their message across. His list of clients include jazz pianist Pavel Kaczmarczyk, Warsaw Club Sketch Night, as well as an international PR agency, Grayling. 
He also gives lectures on public relations at the Academy for Music Managers. Wukash used to be a music journalist for over 15 years. He was the editor-in-chief of T-Mobile Electronic Beats show on 4Fun TV and was co-responsible for electronicbeats.pl. Prior to that, he had his own show on Polish Radio 4, worked for three different TV stations as a host and had his own column in a music magazine and co-created soundrevolt.com, a bilingual website dedicated to electronic music. Welcome to Poland Daily Culture, I'm John Carter, and on this week uh, we'll be looking into Polish electronic music. I'm joined by my guest today, Mr. Łukasz Dopora. Hello. Welcome to the show. Uh, so, first of all, Łukasz, uh, just a little bit of background on yourself. So, uh, until recently, you were the uh, sort of, shall we say, promoter of uh, Audio River, Poland's premier uh, electronic music festival. I was one of the organizers, one of the three people that founded the festival. I was co-responsible for the program, for its strategy, uh, the program strategy, and mainly for the communication of it. So I was the marketing guy, the PR guy, the spokesperson, and the face of the of the event. And so, uh, for people who maybe are, aren't familiar with Audio River, uh, could you tell us a little something about it and how you got started with the festival? Uh, there are probably many people who are unaware that Audio River exists because it's a it's a niche kind of music. Well, it was when we started in 2006. It's electronic music, it's quality electronic music that you probably don't uh, really see on mainstream media or hear on mainstream radio. Um, it's a niche that's growing and uh, people are gathering, you know, big festivals are gathering hundreds of thousands of people. Like Tomorrowland in Belgium has 250,000 people uh, for this kind of music. So. It's huge uh, in the world, and uh, and now it's also big in Poland. So it's uh, it's about quality electronic music. Um, we started in 2006. Uh, we have DJs. We have they have. I don't have anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, DJs, live acts, bands. You know all kinds of different genres, from house to techno to drum and bass to to pop. Because there are many pop artists that are electronic music artists. There's a lot of Right now, pop is mainly electronic, so the, the boundaries are really blurred right now. Mm -hmm. So um, we started in 2006 as a, we wanted to be a quality mu electronic music festival uh, and not just like a mainstream electronic music festival that were going on in Poland uh, in, in, at that time. Uh, we wanted to have some quality music without the mainstream music because we wanted to have some, I'm sorry to say that, quality people. Because at mainstream electronic music events with trance music like Tiesto and, and there was a lot of aggression, mm -hmm. people in track suits, uh, we call it dresse, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, uh, but that was the problem. And I, when I went to uh, parties like that, uh, I didn't feel safe. Mm -hmm. So there could be a stage with uh, quality music, uh, electronic music, niche, alternative. Uh, so you could go there, but then when you went to, a, like, say, a food station or a food court, you felt like you're not in the right place. You're, you feel, OK, I'm just this small, thin little guy with all these people going to gym five <laughs> times a week. So we, did, we wanted to build something different, and mm -hmm. that's how Audio River came about. And uh, the first flyer, the first poster, was showing three signs, like road signs. Electronic music uh, is a way of connecting people, gathering together just for the um, feeling.
Well, if, uh, yeah. just in case people aren't aware of what yeah. the kind of white glove culture yeah. is, yeah. Uh, you know, this is kind of like hardcore and glow sticks yes. and do 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 do. Very simple electronic music uh -huh. and uh, and simple people, I would say. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but we wanted to have something different and and maybe get those people that will go to those events and teach them a different way of, of partying and teach them a different way of uh, different kinds of music. So no glow sticks, no white gloves. Well, there was no, we didn't have anything against glow sticks, but <laughs> white gloves were like a statement, not this kind of uh, party here. Huh? Uh, also, there was a tracksuit. There was uh, no tracksuits, so we didn't want dress it. And uh, also, there was a cow that was right. crossed. And, uh, I don't get that. In Poland, we say bydło, which is like make, being rude and, unco you know, right. basically being rude and not knowing how to behave. Yeah. So no such behavior on our venue, at our venue. So this was the statement um, and, and we had three stages and the party was for free uh, for the first two years. Uh, first year, 20,000 people, the second year, 40,000 people, but there was a great weather and you could even see like people from Płock because it's in not it's not in some major city it's in Płock which is like 1000 100,000 people mm -hmm. 120,000 people um, it used to be a capital of Poland for like a short while oh, really i yeah. didn't know that okay <laughs> yes but very short while and um, uh, and it's a beautiful place mm -hmm. but still not the biggest one and uh, a bit of aside from main uh, you know communication uh, routes yeah, routes, yeah. so uh, this is uh, uh, this is on the second in the second year we could see you know women from Płock strolling with their you know uh, children uh, through the festival grounds. Uh -huh. It was for free; anyone could get in. So there was a, like a mixture of electronic fans and just people who were bored in Płock. Uh -huh. So the third year we started to you know get tickets, uh, get, uh, expect money for entering. And, and the first was 30 slots, then the next year like 70, year after year a bit more. And now the festival is like 200 or 300 slots per ticket. Damn. And with 30,000 people paying for the tickets and going from all kinds of po parts of Poland and, and Europe as well. So it grew, uh, it grew organically, it grew um, with heart, with passion, you know, it wasn't like there's some big event that we see right now that's like, okay, let's, we have a big brand, communication brand, let's do a big festival with big mm. names. We were growing year by year. Mr. Wukash Napora, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Join us next time on Poland Daily Culture and we'll be back again same time tomorrow. Goodbye. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Poland Daily History. Today, we will be traveling to the city of Lublin in eastern Poland to meet with Zemowit Kalowicz from Theater NN, a cultural institution which safeguards the memory of the city's Jewish population which flourished for centuries before Germany invaded Poland in 1939 and murdered almost all of the Polish Jews. The Jewish population peaked in terms of percentage in Lublin during the 19th century until people around Lublin started moving in. And I think before the Second World War, there's still one third of the population being Jewish. I was hoping you could elaborate about the cooperation or the relationship between the Polish population and the Jewish population between the world wars. Well, it's a very long subject, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I can say that uh, more and more uh, Polish people mm -hmm. were uh, traveling to our town and settling here mm -hmm. uh, because of development of our town. Yeah. There were new factories um, uh, that were <laughs> being created in our town. Mm -hmm. uh, the city was more and more uh, modern uh, with electricity and so on. And, uh, also, Jewish people uh, that were here, uh, most of them were of the Hasidic movement. Um, and they, while uh, they were under um, Tsar regime, uh, 
they were kind of persecuted. They were not the first class citizens. Right. When the freedom of Poland started in 1918, uh, suddenly they found themselves the first class citizens with all of the privileges and laws that Polish people in had. Lublin. In Lublin also. And they, well, they also started to develop. Mm -hmm. uh, the Kassidic community built amazing building, uh, the second yeshiva, the high rabbinic school, uh, that is uh, one of the not many places that are still in existence today. They were, it was not destroyed by uh, Germans. Uh, they uh, gathered the uh, most important and uh, most uh, the wisest rabbis to, uh, to teach in that school. Uh, it was an Oxford for the Jewish people. Mm. Uh, to be a student of this university, you have to be, um, you have to have a letter of recommendation from two separate rabbis. You have to pass a very hard exams and so on. And the rabbis that graduated at that, that uh, university were really sought after in all of the Europe. Um, also, the, but the Catholic movement was not only movement in the uh, Jewish district. There were socialists, uh, secular Jews. Uh, they were trying to create a new uh, building, uh, a community house for, for Jewish people, uh, the House of Paris, they were calling this. And uh, this building, uh, this community center, should be opened on the September the 1st of 1939. This was the day the war broke out right. and it was never really opened. Mm. Also, there were assimilated Jews, uh, Jews like Franciszka Arsteinova, the great poet. Right. You see, when I'm reading the poems of that lady, she's Polish, she's really deeply patriotic. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were many Jews like this, but all of these um, uh, groups have the one point of interest that was joining them. Mm -hmm. It was a trade. Yeah. And they were trying to make a living, uh, mm -hmm. let's say. Uh, so some of them were trading with Polish uh, citizens, but some of them, especially Kassidic uh, people, were very closed. Uh, th their society was not open for uh, another religions or cultures. So they were trading among each other, they were in marrying among each other, having friends and so on. Uh, these people were speaking mostly Yiddish. Some of them were not speaking Polish at all. Um, they were hiring translators when they have to go to the court. Polish law was not had no problem. Polish authorities had no problem with this. Mm -hmm. um, but still, this was a very closed society, and Polish people were not interfering with this. Um, still, the people who were let's say uh, assimilated, they have their part with uh, the life of our city, of light of life of our town, uh, cu cultural life and uh, many others. You see, um, they were, have uh, theaters, they have cinemas, uh, movies like the book was made uh, on, in the Kazimierz near Lublin. Mm. Uh, this was one of the greatest uh, Yiddish movie ever made. Mm -hmm. um, many other uh, cultural events were taking uh, place in the Jewish district. Also, there were mm, things like uh, football teams, Jewish football teams, Maccabi Lublin. Uh, they were playing with uh, Polish <laughs> football teams mm -hmm. also, and there were some even uh, problems with uh, uh, football fans, okay. <laughs> like always, <laughs> let's say. Um, um, but still, these three groups, the major groups, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, secular Jews, mm -hmm. assimilated Jews, and um, Kassidic Jews, were the well have the same rights and and uh, privileges that all of the citizens had, and they were just living here mm -hmm. with no great problems. Uh, in late 30s, there were some problems like broken windows made by some of um, uh, well nationalists and so on. But still, it was not nothing big. Nobody right. was ever killed. There was no pogrom or something it's like this. The exception, not well, the exception, culture at the time. absolute exception. Yeah. Uh, but still, some Jewish people were feeling unsafe. Mm -hmm. uh, the Zionist movement was born, and some of the Jewish people were traveling to Palestine to build uh, another uh, place for the Jewish people mm -hmm. that would be later called Israel.
Today, the citizens of Israel speak Hebrew, but their Ashkenazi ancestors spoke the language Yiddish. Next up, our guide Mr. Karovish will tell us the significance of this ancient, near-forgotten language. In our earlier conversation, you brought up the language Yiddish. And as I know, it's a blend of many languages, but that's my extent of the knowledge when it comes to that. So if you can tell me a little bit about what happened at the time. Well, uh, Yiddish is a very special language. Right. Uh, you see, when the Jews uh, came to Europe, mm -hmm. uh, they were mostly speaking some Roman language. Right. We are not really sure how it sound, uh, uh, sounded. <laughs> but when they were coming uh, to the east, mm -hmm. they were tra traveling through Germany. Mm -hmm. And they pick up, pick up lots and lots of the words and, and the grammatic structure of uh, the uh, German language. Mm -hmm. When they came to Poland, uh, they again pick up some words from Slavic uh, speaking mm -hmm. uh, Polish people and they created unique language with some parts Hebrew, some parts uh, from Roman languages, mm -hmm. many parts, most of the parts were from the German mm -hmm. language and also some words are Polish uh, words. Mm -hmm. uh, also, <laughs> when they were speaking this mm -hmm. language, uh, they were, mm, well, creating some uh, special uh, language for all of the people who lived, uh, lived around them. Mm -hmm. Let's say in uh, Polish uh, Lublin, there, were, there are some words from Yiddish, mm -hmm. still to this day. When I was a little kid, I was uh, calling my brother Breidak, mm -hmm. not knowing that this, what, what does it really mean? Right. This is from Broidak, this is from Yiddish. Oh. Uh, many other words are uh, also, uh, <laughs> like for the naughty child, Bachor, mm -hmm. it is also from Yiddish. Yeah. Also, the Yiddish language pick up many words from Pol Polish, like Sosna, or even uh, the uh, pickles are called Ogurkas, <laughs> this is also Polish, yeah. Polish word. Um, the Kasidic minority in Lublin uh, were uh, extremely uh, uh, connected to that language. Mm -hmm. All of the wise men were speaking this language. They were creating the books of literature, of, of uh, philosophy, of theology mm -hmm. in exactly this language. Mm -hmm. They were speaking on a daily basis in this language. Why? Because Hebrew was the holy language. They were, all of them were learning Hebrew, but mm -hmm. Hebrew was the language uh, that should not be sullied uh, by using to to say the daily Conduct trade or daily yes, stuff. yes. So they were speaking uh, Yiddish, mm -hmm. and uh, you can see Yiddish on the posters for films, for mm -hmm. movies. On that time, for the uh, mm, uh, theater plays, uh, but also <laughs> on the every sign of the shop, there were some Yiddish letters or something like this. Mm -hmm. So it was a very popular language. In it's almost Lublin. like a representation of how the cultures mingle together. Yes, if, very, mm -hmm. very close. After centuries of coexistence between Poles and Jews, Lublin lost its Jewish population during the Second World War. Cultural institutions such as Theater NN are putting in a great effort to remind Poles about the centuries of joint Polish-Jewish history and the traces it has left on today's Poland. Hello everybody and welcome to Poland Daily Travel, where this time we say, head east young man. We're going in search of eastern promise to the Białystok region, about two hours, give or take a few kilometers uh, east of Warsaw. This is an area of hidden treasures, castles, palaces, wildlife, and of course water and the great forests. The Brunitsky Palace in the center of Białystok stands out as a Baroque masterpiece, often compared in its own way to a smaller version of Versailles. Then there is the unmissable little fairy tale town of Tkochen. It lies in bucolic splendor astride the Narev River, with its fine church and synagogue. 
and restored castle. It's an undiscovered Baroque jewel. And so we scratched the surface at least to tempt you to the wonders of this beautiful and wild region of Poland. We know you're going to really enjoy these episodes. So stay tuned as Poland Daily takes you to the Białystok region, in the far east of Poland. Visit our Poland Daily Live page and subscribe to all our great programs. Thanks for watching. Welcome back to Poland Daily Travel, and this is very exciting. We're here on Passover Friday, and uh, I'm standing and talking to Bogosław, who is a local historian, and we're in the Bima and the great synagogue in Tkoczyn, which is a beautiful small town in eastern Poland near Białystok. Um, what is a, could I sit in one of these chairs? Oh, of course not. What it's, do you mean, of course not? It's This sounded me. optimistic at the beginning, no, but no? Why can't I sit there? Because it's a really wolf meaning for- I can't sit here, no? Maybe not try. No. Maybe not try. I, c I shouldn't sit here or you there. You shouldn't sit. But no. this one, yeah. you could use just in the one situation of your life. Yeah, what would that If be? you would have a son, it will be eighth day of his life. The and eighth day of his life? Yeah, and yeah. he will go here to synagogue okay. to, work, to make circumcision. To make a circumcision? Yeah. Good Lord. So yeah. it's the first ritual uh -huh. that will mark that guy as a yeah. Jew. Okay. And to that fact, we need a special chair. Okay. It's every time it's divided as for two people, but okay. it's not for two people. It's just for one guy that right. he will sit here with, with, with kid, with a boy, and on the, another place will sit the prophet Elia. The prophet Elia? Yeah. You mean the actual one or, or the, the, his stand-in? We know that he's here during that moment. Ah, he's, his spirit is here. Yeah. This is what we're talking about. So the spirit of the prophet Elia is here, and the kid's on the other side, and it's, so it's basically a circumcision chair. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. It's like a doctor's office or something. We can say like that. Sense. Yeah. yeah. Of course, it was in traditional community. Yeah. Now we will go to hospital. We will go to the hospital for yeah. that. But in the old days, if you were, you got, you were lucky, because you could get it in front of everybody here in the church. Yep. Good Lord. A day of life. Yeah, on the eighth day of your life. So probably not a good idea for me to sit in there in case the prophet Elia, you know, Maybe he wants to get up to something. <laughs> he wants to get up to some mischief. Okay, yeah. a little, a little humor in the synagogue. Um, what else would be taking place here? Try to imagine that yeah. the boy that will is already after circumcision. Okay. The next time that he will can stand here, it will be in the 13 years. Okay. Later, it will be the moment of bar mitzvah. At 13. At 13. Your graduation yeah. to manhood. In, yeah, in and graduation, yeah. graduation yeah. to manhood, mm -hmm. it's without any, you know, blood. Okay. It's, you need to go here, stand in the front of everybody, okay. and learn some text from Torah, uh -huh. and make interpretation. Because uh -huh. interpretation means that you can think that your mind is on the level of adult guy. Ah, I see. So you're graduating to manhood, and you have a certain intellectual responsibility at that point, is that it? Yeah. Yeah. You can get married. You can get married at 13? I thought that was only in the Ozark Mountains. Uh, no? Not. No. Traditional also, Jewish communities also here. rules the same law. But, but this also looks to me like a place, would this be a place where the preacher or the equivalent, the rabbi, uh, would, yeah. would stand and, and of speak? Course. Of course, it's yeah. a place mm -hmm. when a rabbi will go here with yeah. Torah, uh -huh. and from here he will read it. And he will address the congregation. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's the, beautiful acoustic here. It's, well, yeah, we it's, can see. You know, uh, we can hear, actually. Yeah. Yeah. It's like in the good uh, Greek theater. Yeah. yeah. So this little archway, or rather tall archway, Baroque, we could say archway, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, would uh, the sound goes up and then it goes out through, the, through these, uh, these arches at the top and also out through here. Okay, so we're, this is the place where the main rituals take place. It's the bar mitzvah, it's the circumcision 
uh, it is... And all uh, liturgy. Yeah. And all the liturgy takes place here. So this is rather a large pulpit. If you're a Christian, you would look at this as yeah. a, a yeah, large yeah. example of the pulpit. Okay, so you have a central command. Um, all around, we have men and women sitting and children? Just men. Just adults. Only men. Only men, only adults, so means... Yeah. The, 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 and that's the case till today, right? Yep. Uh-huh. And the feminists don't complain about that? They have no time to complain. They're not allowed to complain. They are not allowed to complain. Very yeah. interesting. Um, okay, so this room would be... This is very dramatic. So you have uh, the uh, rabbi... Uh, is there only one rabbi, or is he joined? It's one. It's just one who, mm -hmm. who's in charge. So the rabbi is here, and he is performing the liturgy, and the place is is full uh, around him yeah. of, of men of only. Yep. Okay, stay with us. On Poland Daily Travel, we're in the Great Synagogue in Tkachin. Uh, we're in the Great Synagogue in Tkachin. Okay, got it out right. And uh, we're going to go find out what the women and children do, right? Would let's that be go. Okay? All right, let's go have a look. Stay with us. Be right back. Okay, Bogusław, we're here in the uh, part where the women and children uh, would be watching uh, what's happening in the main room where the men are. But this is an important room. Why don't you tell us about it, or an important section of this, uh, of this uh, hallway? Yeah, we already spoke about the fate of Jewish community of Tikachin. And uh, I said to you that in the August of 1941, all communities, so it means about 2,000 people, were forced to go to Lopuhovo forest and they were shot to death there. And that's what we can see here. It's a tombstone that stands like a memorabilia of, of the place. So th this is there today? And yeah, there it's a, how it looks monument. today. So they were marched off to a forest several kilometers from it's about the town. Five, yeah, about yeah. five kilometers. About five kilometers and they were all killed. Okay. Yeah. But, yeah. but not all people went there. Not everyone went there? Not okay. everyone. It, it was... Uh, Some escaped? Yeah, it was it were 70 people okay. that, according to many reasons, weren't at that moment in Tikachin. Okay. Some of them were in, in other towns, and one guy, Abraham Kapitza, stayed in his house. Abraham? Abraham Kapitza. Kapitza. Abraham Kapitza, okay. Yeah, and he stayed in his house. Mm -hmm. in the moment when Germans ordered for everybody to go to that forest. Okay. Why? Because his father asked him to do. And he said, stay here and look on, on everything. Maybe they will come here and will try to steal something. They'll try to steal our chickens yeah. or our goats or something, yeah. So stay here and keep an eye on things. Keep an yeah. eye on things. Yeah. And he survived. As if you could stop the Germans from taking what they wanted, yeah. Yeah. And as far as I know, uh, Abraham Kapitza, time was really, you know, angry on his father because of that. Because he wanted to go with everybody to, to you know, to... It's almost like a parable, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, he was angry with his father, but his father saved him. You know, it's almost biblical in a sense, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's an incredible R story. Incredible story. These are some effects of his. his yeah. uh, these objects belong to him? Yeah, Is that correct? he spent all yeah. war in, uh, in the camps. At first in the ghetto, yeah. in, in Bialystok, in Yashanovka, and later uh -huh. he was moved to the concentration camp somewhere in Germany. And he was liberated by American army in 1945. And after the war, like, he emigrated to Israel and he lived there till his uh, final day. And, but what we have here? We have stuff that he bring to, brought to the to, to Museum of Tikachin after the war because he was coming back here. It was his town and he, you know, he felt still a huge connection with that place. And what's the, the most, I guess it's, what, what's give us hope that the history of Tikachin Jews didn't finish in Wopuchowo, but because of for example, Abraham Kapitza, it continues, it's still, still alive. Just yesterday, you, you haven't, you know, chance to meet the family of Abraham Kapitza, with his daughter and grandchildren that came They here. were here? Yeah, they were here yesterday. yesterday. What a shame we missed them, yeah. yeah. Um, they uh, live where now? 
in Israel. They live in Israel. Yeah. Yeah. So they're part of the 70,000 people that pilgrimage here every year. Every year. Excellent. This, the man's name, Abraham? Kapitza. Kapitza. Okay, I'm here with Bogoslav in uh, the Grand uh, Synagogue in the wonderful town of Tkaczyn in eastern Poland near Białystok. Watch Poland Daily Travel. We're watching you. Stay with us.